director from Microsoft. So, you know, it's important to discuss research ideas, but it's also very, very important to discuss the commercial, you know, commercial pr products and, uh, you know, solutions and services. So this will give you a flavor of what are the challenges that people face in real world. And especially when you do, when you provide services as global scale, a planet scale, right? For example, uh, so here, see, uh, this is all we have already discussed it. Yeah, so I'll start from here. So the, see, the whole point is, uh, Microsoft has its own data centers. So, and multiple services are running in Microsoft Cloud. Microsoft has this uh, Azure Cloud and, you know, Bing services. So they are running on the servers of Microsoft. So, and it's not that only neural networks are running. There are other services also that are running. Okay. So now the goal is how to accelerate a large range of machine learning services on a hardware. So how do you choose the hardware? So for example, maybe 10 years ago, Microsoft had this question. Should we invest in designing our own ASIC or should we just purchase GPU or should we just use CPU or should we just or should we invest in FPGA? So CPUs, of course, maybe out of question because CPUs don't give a lot of good. Uh, CPU doesn't go, give very good performance. So obviously you have to look for an accelerator. That could be GPU, FPG or ASIC. Now GPUs, although they are they good, they give very good performance, but it, it's costly, right? GPUs are costly, and uh, it also consumes a lot of power. So now you have to either design your own ASIC or or use FPGA. So Microsoft decided to invest in FPGA. So that's why their data center has the highest investment in of FPGA. Okay. So here. Uh, Actually, here this hard DPU and this ASIC are shown as separate, but as I will show in the next slide, they are considered mostly same. So now the point is different companies are investing in different uh, accelerators. So example of ASICs are Cerebras, uh, actually uh, Graphcore, Grok, Nirvana. Movidius, wave computing. So actually, Nirvana product has been stopped, and Intel has instead moved to uh, Habana Labs, Goya, and Godi processor. So I have all those presentation. If we get time, we will discuss all of them. Movidius, I will not discuss, and wave computing, I don't have presentation. But all other, I have presentations. If time permits, we'll discuss them. Now, whereas there are other companies who are investing in FPGA, so Brainwave. Accelerator from Microsoft, then Badoos, Deep Defy, ESC, Teradip. So all of them have used FPGA based designs. So an ASIC is a, so here you can see we have actually used them as the same thing. ASIC is a fixed function device and it can take years to design an updated chip. Okay, so as I said, like for example, Google uh, from there, they started working on TPU from around, from year around, you know, 2014. So now actually seven, almost seven or you know, seven years have passed. But in seven years, they have only four versions of TPU. Whereas if you see Microsoft, what they're claiming here, a new soft DPU, which is better suited to a more powerful FPGA, FPGA can be designed in a few weeks. Okay, so even though FPGA cannot match the performance of an ASIC, the point is, Incrementally, you can keep on improving. If, if if a better FPGA hardware comes, you can design your architecture better way to use that FPGA. If your algorithms change, for example, instead of MLP today, tomorrow everybody starts using, you know, BERT. Then you can change your DPU and you know you, you know design something for BERT. That's the idea. So, for example, Bing has real time latency requirement. We all know, right? If search engine doesn't give result in you know less than three seconds, you will you will probably start another another tab or maybe close the web browser completely. OK, so that's why in, in these user facing applications, there are requirement of latency. Uh, or for example, like uh, there are, you know, uh, you know, this echo and other there are smart speakers. So we want them to respond to us in real time. I, I don't use it. I don't like it, but uh, just as a matter of technological discussion. So because if you ask somebody and they reply after two minutes, Will that be a real time conversation? No, right? So now you see that in user facing services, you always need real time response. And also it's algorithm and models evolve rapidly. So Microsoft engineers regularly adapt this ISA 
in microarchitecture to new requirements, pushing modified FPG images into production environment within days to weeks. So as that means as their service is improving, Bing is a service they provide, and as you have better search algorithms, you can immediately modify your FPG architecture. I mean your hardware. I mean your your the brainwave architecture, which is pushed to FPG. So brainwave is the name of the architecture, and FPG is the hardware on which you map the architecture. So here you can see Microsoft has the world's largest cloud investment in FPGAs, and it provides multiple EXA operations. So anybody know, knows what is EXA? Anybody knows what is EXA? Nobody knows. Oh. Okay, so EXA is EXA scale. EXA is see there is Terra, which is 10 to power 12. Then there's Peta, which is 10 to power 15, and Exa is 10 to power 18. Okay, so 10 to power 18 operations of aggregate capacity. So micro brainwave runs on Microsoft's Microsoft's scale infrastructure, accelerates Bing and Azure. So FPGs are ideal for adapting to rapidly evolving machine learning. So there are actually even in machine, I mean, even machine learning, there are a lot of models, not just neural network, but there are LSTMs, RNNs, MLP, reinforcement learning, feature extraction, decision tree. So if you design, if you are to use ASIC, you will have to design one ASIC for each of them. But with FPGAs, although you don't get as high performance as ASIC, but at least single FPGA can work for many of them and give reasonably good performance, uh, reasonably good performance. So yeah, these are some things I will skip. OK, so here now. Uh, so FPGs are deployed in Microsoft servers. So actually catapult is another uh, another you know technique or some architecture from 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 you know Microsoft only, which was described in this paper. But I I don't much understand that, so I will skip that. We'll we'll focus on brainwave architecture. So here we have actually two CPUs connected to one FPGA. Okay, we have. Uh, two two CPUs connected with one FPG, and here it is Gen 3. So actually, this PCI. If, if I get time, actually, I will try to explain in, in a very nutshell what is this PCI and what is this X8 and Gen 3. I will try to explain that later. But this is the PCI connection. So gen, gen, you know, Gen Gen 1 is Generation 1, Generation 2, Generation 3, Generation 4. Okay, so that is this is you know, evolving generation, and there is X X8. X16 and so on. This shows the bit width that you get. That means how much bandwidth you get between host and the device, which are connected over the PCI Express bus. Fine. So this is the, for example, sometime you will see Gen 3, some Gen 3, sometime you will see Gen 4, and so on. Sometime you will see X8, sometime you will see X16 or maybe X32. Okay. This QPI is the Intel's Quick Path interconnect, which connects uh, two CPUs. So this is a server which has two CPUs on it. OK, so. OK, so this is interesting. So here you can see. Uh, here we have a layer. I mean, this is not a you know, this is not a physical connection, but logically speaking. OK, this is the logically speaking. We have a lot of CPUs. OK, and we have a lot of FPGAs. And we, these FPGAs connect to each other through the routers. So this is interconnected FPGAs because we are connected through the router. So they are interconnected FPGAs. So they form a separate plane of computation. OK, so here you can see very, very interestingly. These FPGAs, some of them can be used for web search ranking like Bing. Some of them can be used for deep learning. Some of them can be used for SQL. Some of them can be used for SDN, software defined networking. So this was not possible with ASIC, right? So the whole point is in, in, in cloud, many, many type of workloads can run. So, uh, so using FPGAs allows you to accelerate many, many types of workloads. Okay. And, and another point is one FPGA can talk to other without going through the CPU. Okay. So this, these uh, FPGAs can be managed and used independently from the CPU. So this is very, very because whenever you have host in between, then there is additional bottleneck. Okay, so you don't want uh, the host to come into picture. 
So any questions till this point? Okay. Now here, see, we have pooled. So this pooling is not the pooling layer. Here pooling is just a not reg regular English meaning. We, we pool, pool two things together, right? So that's the pooling. So here uh, we have put all these FPGAs uh, together. So that is interconnected FPGAs. So if a workload doesn't fit in one FPGA, as I showed on the last presentation, right? We had multiple FPGAs connected with each other, each other and there was one controller FPGA similarly here. So if workload doesn't fit in one FPGA, it can be spread across multiple FPGAs. And the hop latency is two microseconds. That means between one FPGA and another FPGA, this latency is two microseconds. Okay, so remember this number. Later on, when we discuss something else, some other accelerator, then we will ask you to compare. And the whole point is it doesn't require you to go through the CPU. You can directly have one FPGA talking to another. Okay, so FPGA is linked to the Azure network. So any processor in Azure can access any single FPGA or multiple of them running in DNN for inference. For example, if one service which is running on Azure network requires five FPGs, another requires 50, it, it's it's very, very easily stretchable, right? Okay, give five FPGA to me, give five, 50 FPGA to another, another service. That can be done very easily because this is like independent planes. So you, you, you just pay for whatever FPGAs you are using. If you are a user using those cloud services, just pay for what you are using. Now, next thing is, oh, sorry. So, now, now that CPB is yes, that, yes, question. Yes, sir. Sir, uh, in the last slide, you said like if we exceed the limit of using one FPGA, we can like use the another FPGA simultaneously. Yes. Yes, sir. But in the like the previous slide where you showed the 3D structure, like if we uh, like here the FPGAs uh, are allotted for different uh, procedures. No, this, so, is, this is not a free, no, no, this is an example. This is not a fixed thing. This is just an example that, okay, at any particular point of time, some FPGAs could be used for one service and some of them can be used for another service. This is just an example. Okay, okay. So in general, FPGAs like, are flexible. See, initially, see, initially, we have all the FPGAs available for us to use. Now, we start one service, somebody in India, somebody in Australia, somebody in Japan, each of them ask, okay, you give them that FPGA. And this is just one snapshot in one particular point of time. Now the Japan user stops working. So now those FPGAs are available. Okay, okay, sir. Okay. Okay, so here, uh, uh, this is this is the uh, at best size of one. What is the compute latency and the, what is the communication latency? So I will explain. So I, I hope have you heard of tail latency? What is tail? Has anybody heard of what is tail latency? So in gate, there is this percentile score, right? Everybody has given gate. So this percentile score. So so here actually there is the same point of percentile is coming. This is 99th percentile, this is 50th percentile. So tail latency means the whole point is like there are different services and for example, there, there are different queries. Some queries may take less time, some queries may take more time. So tail latency means the worst case latency. Okay. If different different queries don't have the same latency, they will have different latency. Then in the worst case, how much latency does it take? Okay. So tail latency now here, this is the 99th percentile means like really, really, really worst case. So here, even in the 99th percentile, it is less than 1000 microsecond. Okay, so so serve, serve, the word serve actually means inference. Okay, here the word serve, actually inference is also called servicing or serving. Okay, so this word actually, please remember, serve is not the ordinary English meaning of serve. Serve here means inference. So it, that means the inference takes tens of millisecond on well-tuned CPU implementations. So that's why, see the whole point is, 
see even though even though we have this 2 2 2 millisecond latency right this so sorry 2 microsecond latency this 2 microsecond latency is nothing compared to the other latencies which are there that means the latency of brain wave it can be easily hidden even in the worst case see the 50th percentile means like somewhere like best case or, or the average case right 50th is like the average case so average case is that it will take uh, maybe uh, how much 250 250 microsecond but that is fine but even in the worst case if you use fpga the latency remains less than one millisecond it, it, it takes less than one millisecond which is nowhere compared to the tens of millisecond taken on cpu so compared to tens of millisecond on cpu this less than one millisecond on fpga is quite easily acceptable that's right Okay, so in this architecture, you know, uh, this brainwave system, they have, you know, their own compiler, their own runtime, their own architecture, microarchitecture. Then there's a persistency, persistency idea I will discuss. Then there are hardware microservices. So that means the actual your hardware FPGA, where everything gets mapped to. So here you have the compiler and runtime for compiling the models to soft DPUs. So soft DPUs like similar to FPGA. I mean, soft DPUs ultimately get mapped to FPGA. So we will use this term interchangeably. Then you have an ISA for narrow precision DNA inference. So anybody remembers for TPU version one, what was the data type? Int, int eight. Yeah, and for TPU version two and three, what was the data type? We can use brain floating BF16 16 or uh, FP32 also. BF16. Yeah. So. BF16, BF16, yeah. So here we'll see another another data type. Okay, but point is it is still narrow. That means low, low precision. So your ISA has to have provide support for that. For example, I'll give you an example. For example, if you try to, uh, some of our students have tried, they they've used int 8 model and they've used it on Colab, Google Colab. But they don't get good performance. Why? Because although at software level, you are working with only int 8, but the hardware does not provide a support for that. Probably they are the, the CPU that is there is old or maybe or the GPU there, there is very old. So it does not provide native support for int 8. So th that means even though your software can work with, that means at the algorithm level you're working with int 8, but because there is no hardware support, int, int 8 is much, much, much slower than in even FP32 or FP16. So that's why you need full stack support. Whenever you do narrow precision, you, you must have hardware support for that. Only then it will give extra performance. So that's why they have done that. It has adapted its own ISA, and it is flexible to support new new AI algorithms. Okay, so here you have Brainwave soft DPU microarchitecture, which is optimized for uh, narrow precision, low batch size. So while low batch size is important, I will discuss very soon. Okay, so if you remember in TPU, the batch size was between eight to two hundred. Okay, here we'll see what is the batch size. Now, persistency is a term I will discuss very soon. And finally, you use whatever FPGA from one company or another. So Brainwave takes the DNNs, compiles them so that they can be done on Brainwave soft DPU. Those that soft DPU is loaded into FPGA. And those FPGAs are present either. You can have them locally present with you, but here they are present in the in the cloud. That means in the Microsoft servers. So first, let us discuss them. So here is the idea. So here you may write your model in CAF, CNTK, or TensorFlow, or whatever language or framework that it supports. Mm -hmm. Then now it comes under compiler. We are not discussing too much about compiler, but actually whenever you have compiler, so you will convert them into an intermediate representation. So IR means intermediate representation. Okay. So for for example, like what happens if you like introspect? Uh, for example, somebody whose whose who's mother tongue is not English. When somebody speaks English to him, they, they don't directly actually think in English. They will first convert or translate that into their native language. Then their response will be in their own native language. And then again, they will respond. They will internally translate that into English and then they will speak it. And that's why sometimes even the construct of you know English and other language could be different. So you can see the their, their background comes into picture. Okay, you are from that state, probably because the construct in Bengali is different or Hindi is different or Marathi or Kannada. And really, so you can see that effect. So similarly that IR, the point I'm taking IR. So here in that their mother tongue is acting as an intermediate representation. 
so similarly here actually whether it is you know english french or german here that that means this different models all of that will be converted to intermediate representation now a, a neural network is model as a graph so now you will convert that into target compiler for uh, now it will be transformed that some, okay some of it should go into cpu using some of that will go into fpga okay and finally you map it right whichever part goes to fpga that will be that will be you know mapped to fpga okay so that's the idea so this is the compiler workflow so here sometime you know your neural network model may be quite big so you have to split it okay so some part some of these nodes will be mapped to fpga 0 some of them will be mapped to fpga 1 Okay, so during here is a summary of what we have discussed in the previous slide. So during offline compilation, brainwave tool flow splits DNN models into subgraphs. Now each of this can fit into on-chip FPGA memory or run on the CPU. Okay, so the point is, FPGA has its own limitations on on-chip memory. So depending on that, that's all you can do on one FPGA. If if your model is larger, you need two FPGAs. when subgraphs are pinned so what is the spinning i will discuss that is same as persistency many terabytes per second of memory bandwidth can be de delivered to a single dnn query so this enables fpga to achieve ultra low latency at ne at near peak efficiency that means for example 90% utilization at best size of one so i will i will come back to this slide in a, in a moment so i again i will skip this slide i I'll, i'll come back to it one one minute i want to discuss uh this first okay i, I will come back to that so so now why, why cpu is useful so there are some some operations which are not either they are not supported on fpga or, or they are not suitable for fpga so they are they are implemented on cpus so this we have already discussed in the previous slide now uh, we have already discussed about uh, arithmetic intensity so there are some of the neural networks like cnns which have high compute to data ratio that means high value of ai they do lot of um, uh, they, they do lot of computations on the, the, the on the data that they fetch usually it is matrix matrix multiplication there is there are other other neural networks or other deep learning models like mlps lstm gru where they do very few computations it's usually matrix vector multiplication so that means their ai remains low okay their ai remains low so because ai remains low now you see uh, remember the roof line model figure if ai is very very low you don't get you don't get good performance right so now our goal the so this is the challenge that they faced and how they solved it let us see now very soon so here uh, they have used two cpus why two cpus because usually fpga gives lot of results fp throughput becomes high and see if you just use a single cpu it cannot match the throughput of fpga so you that's why you use two cpus so that you can match the progress of fpga fine that's why it is 2x cpu so that is actually the if, if you remember the server blade that had uh, two socket cpu so that's why this 2x cpu so conventional approach was model parameters were stored in dram so that was the approach used in tpu version 1 and of course version 2 and 3 right if you remember there was a weight fifo so the in tpu version 1 ddr3 dram had all the weights stored so you fetch it first in the weight fifo then you bring it to the systolic array then use weight stationary format and do, do the computation so the main point we are trying to see is that in in tpu the weights are stored off chip here so so if you use that approach what happens you send a request you fetch the weights from dram you do the computation on fpga the result comes back you give it to the cpu so this is okay for cnn somewhat okay but for memory intensive dns such as such as lstm which have low value of ai now bandwidth will become a bottleneck because if your ai is low then memory bandwidth becomes a bottleneck if your ai is very very high you will achieve very high performance but if your ai is 
low, then you are bot you are in the memory bound region. So that's what we are saying here. So the DRAM bandwidth becomes the bottleneck. So so now I am sure everybody can realize this roofline model was really very good model. In almost every presentation we are discussing that roofline model. Okay. Here is an example. So if you use a low batch size, then actually what happens? Hardware utilization also remains low. Okay, you remember we discussed when 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 we introduced what was you know what is batching. That time we told you that if you are only doing batching, if if you are not doing batching, that means if your batch size is one, then you are doing matrix vector multiplication. But if you do batching, then that gets converted into matrix matrix multiplication. So if you are have if you have matrix matrix multiplication, you can use all the hardware. Assuming you have sufficient hardware, you can do matrix matrix multiplication on that. So, but if your batch size is low. And you have plenty of hardware. That means you are using only you are using only part of the hardware. Okay, so but if you do batching, right? If you do batching, so this is the illustration of batching. You send multiple requests, right? From DRAM, you get fetch all the weights, and one after another, you get all the results. So once you do batching, your hardware utilization is greatly improved. Right, your hardware utilization is greatly improved. This, this is not a roofline model. This is the hardware utilization curve. However, what happens once you do the batching? The latency also improves. Why? Because suppose you, you, you do batching of 10 requests. So first, although. 10 requests will come, but they will not all arrive at the same time. It may be slightly delayed. Plus, even the latency of the overall request can get delayed. For example, let me give some numeric data. So, so for example, if you don't use batching, for example, this latency can be just one millisecond. And, and this latency could be three millisecond. So here you would have a batch size of one. Here you have a batch size of suppose 24. So here, as you increase the batch size, your latency has not increased 24 times, but it has increased from one millisecond to three or five, which could be more than what you can tolerate because in every service there is a limit, right? In all the user-facing services or any, any anything, you will always have some limit of how much latency can be tolerated. So that that limit could be extended. So our ideal is that with low batch size, we want to uh, we want to achieve low latency and also we want to achieve high throughput. Okay, we want to achieve high throughput. Okay, so this is our goal. So now, how did they achieve this goal? Anybody has any thoughts? How can we do that? Probably it is difficult for you to guess. But but at least at least you are clear about the goal. If you have, if you have any question about this topic, please let me know. The goal is use low base size so that your latency is low, but still achieve high throughput. How to do that? OK, so if you understood at least understood the goal, how to do that, that is the next step I will explain. So here the point is persistent neural network. That's what they will use. So here what do they do? So uh, it, it has a DRAM, but let us avoid using DRAM. Okay, although we have the DRAM, but let us avoid using it. Store. Here is the observation. State of the art FP3s have uh, ten, uh, tens of thousands of distributed block RAM, such that their total capacity is tens of megabyte. For example, Stratix FPGA will have, for example, 30 megabytes of on-chip SRAM. And the bandwidth with that on-chip memory is much, much higher than that with the off-chip memory. OK, the bandwidth you get with on chip memory is much, much higher than that you get with the off chip memory. DRAM gives you higher capacity, but bandwidth is lower. Even in CPU, if you can get your data stored in L1 cache or L2 cache or L3 cache, that will give you much higher bandwidth than storing something on deep on, on the DRAM. OK, so. So here based on this. They persist. Persist means permanently store all model parameters in FPGA on chip memory during service lifetime. 
that means instead of storing this model in the DRAM, let us store it in the on chip memory. Now you will say on chip memory just 30 megabytes. What if the model is larger than 30 megabytes? Tell me what now? What if, for example, my, my on chip memory capacity is only 30 megabytes? What if my model is more than 30 megabytes? I already discussed that solution in one of one of the previous slides. Use multiple FPGAs, right? You remember we, we split the model on two FPGAs. The reason was we want to persist. We want we want uh, for whatever you know layers are executing on many FPGAs. All those weights have to be stored on the on-chip memory only. We don't want anything to be stored on DNAM. So that's why if your 30 megabyte capacity is reached, you can't have a bigger model map to that FPGA, so you'll have to split it on the next FPGA. Okay, so this is the idea. So here you can see this illustration now. Please pay, get, uh, pay attention. So here the request comes, just one request. And these are the red things are the weights stored in the on-chip memory of the of the of the FPG and there is a distributed. It's not that there is a single one one large chunk of L2 cache. No, the compute compute units, for example, here it has you know DSPs. Okay, so the DSPs are also spread out across the FPGAs, and SRAM or blo block RAM is also spread out across the FPGA because compute and memory they are closed very close to they are they are placed very close to each other. Okay, so with, when single request arrives, all the chip resources are used to process a single query. So here resources mean on-chip memories and compute unit. So one single query uh, is executed on, on FPGA. So that means best size is kept one and hardware utilization is very, very high, close to 90%. And the uh, latency remains very small because we are not doing any batching. And we are also not accessing the DRAM. So here is an example. So for example, Intel Stratix has total 30 megabytes of on-chip storage. OK, and the bandwidth you get is 35 terabytes per second at 600 megahertz. Maybe at lower frequency, the bandwidth may come down, but at least at 600 megahertz, this is the bandwidth you get. Now, anybody remembers what was the bandwidth in TPU version 1? TP version 1, what was the bandwidth? And TP version 2 and 3, what was the bandwidth? 90, sir. 90? Not 900, sir. 900. In B3. 900 is for TP3. 900 was in version 3, fine. And what was the unit? 900, yeah, but what, what was the unit? 900. M, MB per second. Riyanshi is saying MB per second. Gaurav, what was the unit for 900? MB per second, if I'm not wrong. MB per second. Anybody else? Sir, I'll go with GB per second. Sir, G. 30 GB per second. Tiger, what are you saying? 30? Yes, sir. 30 for what? From DRAM, it was 30 GB per second. For what? TDP version 1 or 2 or 3? Version 1. Version 1. Okay. So for what TPU? TP version 1 from DRAM, it was 30 gigabyte per second. There is no bandwidth in MB per second, so all those answers are wrong. For TP version 2, it was 700. For TP version 3, it was 900 gigabyte per second. So remember, that was the maximum was 900 gigabyte per second. Here it is terabytes per second, 35 terabytes per second. Of course, it is accumul the cumulative bandwidth. Okay, so compare 900 gigabyte per second with 32, so with 35 terabytes per second. This is much, much higher. So the whole point is if you store everything on chip, you get much, much higher bandwidth. OK, so this is the whole motivation behind storing everything on chip. Fine, let us quickly go ahead. So yeah, so instance of brainwave NPU, they allocate storage for tens of millions of parameters and hundreds of thousands of vector elements. So that means this is for memory, this is for compute. And this is the default strategy. This is called pinning or persistency. The pinning or persistency means try to store all the parameters on chip. Okay. And if uh, if your model is such that 
you want to use DRAM, you can also use DRAM. Can be used for buffering activations and waits because intermediate computations are there. Those, those are intermediate results. They can be stored in the DRAM. Okay, so let me quickly go back and now show some of the slides which we skipped. Okay. So here we discuss now this part. So when multiple FPGAs are allocated to host, host a single model, FPGA capacity becomes very, very high. One sim single CPU cannot host it. So that's why you, you can have ma many CPU clients. For, that means, for example, here you have two, two, two CPUs attached to just one FPGA. So this helps having a balance between the host and the accelerator. So partition subgraphs are passed down to device specific backend tools. So whole point is, there are backend tools, right? So, for example, here, if you see this figure. So, for example, here, this is one compiler for CPU, one compiler for FPGA, and they can do specific optimizations for each, each, each of the hardware. For example, you can have CPU specific optimizations, you can have FPGA specific optimizations to get the best possible performance. Okay, this slide we already discussed. So, I'll just discuss one or two more slides and then stop. If the model doesn't fit in one FPGA, you can use multiple FPGAs. Here, for example, this service is using four. This is using so many. This is using, you know, not just one row, but even this row. So multiple FPGAs at data center scale can form a persistent DN microservice, enab enabling scale out. Scale out means you can just increase the number of FPGAs without increasing the latency. Okay, so this part I will discuss. Uh, next time.